Chapter 5 Vang Khan 1175 The country over which Vang Khan ruled was called Kurakate. It bordered upon the country of Katay, which has already been mentioned as forming the northern part of what is now China. Indeed, as its name imports, it was considered in some sense as a portion of the same general district of country. It was that part of Katay which was inhabited by Tartars. Vang Khan was descended from a powerful line of Khans who had reigned over Karakate for many generations. These Khans were a wild and lawless race of men, continually fighting with each other, both for mastery and also for the plunder of each other's flocks and herds. In this way, most furious and cruel wars were often fought between near relatives. Vang Khan's grandfather, whose name was Murgus, was taken prisoner in one of these quarrels by another Khan, who, though he was a relative, was so much exasperated by something that Murgus had done, that he sent him away to a great distance to the king of a certain country, which is called Kurga, to be disposed of there. The king of Kurga put him into a sack, sewed up the mouth of it, and then laid him across the wooden image of an ass, and left him there to die of hunger and suffocation. The wife of Murgus was greatly enraged when she heard of the cruel fate of her husband. She determined to be revenged. It seems that the relative of her husband, who had taken him prisoner, and had sent him to the king of Kurga, had been her lover in former times before her marriage. So she sent him a message, in which she dissembled her grief for the loss of her husband, and only blamed the king of Kurga for his cruel death, and then said that she had long felt an affection for him, and that, if he continued of the same mind as when he had formerly addressed her, she was now willing to become his wife, and offered, if he would come to a certain place, which she specified, to meet her, she would join him there. Nar, for that was the chieftain's name, fell at once into the snare which the beautiful widow thus laid for him. He immediately accepted her proposals, and proceeded to the place of rendezvous. He went, of course, attended by a suitable guard, though his guard was small, and consisted chiefly of friends and personal attendants. The princess was attended also by a guard, not large enough, however, to excite any suspicion. She also took with her in her train a large number of carts, which were to be drawn by bullocks, and which were laden with stores of provisions, clothing, and other such valuables, intended as a present for her new husband. Among these, however, there were a large number of great barrels, or rounded receptacles of some sort, in which she had concealed a considerable force of armed men. These receptacles were so arranged that the men concealed in them could open them from within in an instant, at a given signal and issue forth suddenly all armed and ready for action. Among the other stores which the princess had provided, there was a large supply of a certain intoxicating drink which the Mongols and Tartars were accustomed to make in those days. As soon as the two parties met at the place of rendezvous, the princess gave Nar a very cordial greeting, and invited him and all his party to a feast, to be partaken on the spot. The invitation was accepted. The stores of provisions were opened, and many of the presents were unpacked and displayed. At the feast, Nar and his party were all supplied abundantly with the intoxicating liquor, which, as is usual in such cases, they were easily led to drink to excess. While on the other hand, the princess's party, who knew what was coming, took good care to keep themselves sober. At length, when the proper moment arrived, the princess made the signal. In an instant, the men who had been placed in ambuscade in the barrels burst forth from their concealment and rushed upon the guests at the feast. The princess herself, who was all ready for action, drew a dagger from her girdle and stabbed Nar to the heart. Her guards, assisted by the reinforcement which had so suddenly appeared, slew or secured all his attendants, who were so totally incapacitated, partly by the drink which they had taken, and partly by their astonishment at the sudden appearance of so overwhelming a force, that they were incapable of making any resistance. The princess, having thus accomplished her revenge, marshaled her men, packed up her pretended presence, and returned in triumph home. Such stories as these, related by the Asiatic writers, 
though they were probably often much embellished in the narration, had doubtless all some foundation in fact, and they give us some faint idea of the modes of life and action which prevailed among these half-savage chieftains in those times. Vang Khan himself was the grandson of Murgus, who was sewed up in a sack. His father was the oldest son of the princess who contrived the above-narrated stratagem to revenge her husband's death. It is said that he used to accompany his father to the wars when he was only ten years old. The way in which he formed his friendship for Yezunkai, and the alliance with him which led him to call Temujin his son, and to refuse to take his wife away from him, as already related, was this. When his father died, he succeeded to the command, being the oldest son, but the others were jealous of him, and after many and long quarrels with them, and with other relatives, especially with his uncle, who seemed to take the lead against him, he was at last overpowered or outmaneuvered, and was obliged to fly. He took refuge, in his distress, in the country of Yezunkai. Yezunkai received him in a very friendly manner, and gave him effectual protection. After a time he furnished him with troops, and helped him to recover his kingdom, and to drive his uncle away into banishment in his turn. It was while he was thus in Yezunkai's dominions that he became acquainted with Temujin, who was then very small, and it was there that he learned to call him his son. Of course, now that Temujin was obliged to fly himself from his native country, and abandon his hereditary dominions, as he had done before, he was glad of the opportunity of requiting to the son the favor which he had received, in precisely similar circumstances, from the father, and so he gave Temujin a very kind reception. There is another circumstance which is somewhat curious in respect to Vang Khan, and that is, that he is generally supposed to be the prince whose fame was about this period spread all over Europe, under the name of Prester John, by the Christian missionaries in Asia. These missionaries sent to the Pope, and to various Christian kings in Europe, very exaggerated accounts of the success of their missions among the Persians, Turks, and Tartars. And at last they wrote word that the great Khan of the Tartars had become a convert, and had even become a preacher of the gospel, and had taken the name of Prester John. The word Prester was understood to be a corruption of presbyter. A great deal was accordingly written and said all through Christendom about the great Tartar convert, Prester John. There were several letters forwarded by the missionaries, professedly from him, and addressed to the Pope and to the different kings of Europe. Some of these letters, it is said, are still in existence. One of them was to the King of France. In this letter, the writer tells the King of France of his great wealth and of the vastness of his dominions. He says he has seventy kings to serve and wait upon him. He invites the King of France to come and see him promising to bestow a great kingdom upon him if he will, and also to make him his heir and leave all his dominions to him when he dies, with a great deal more of the same general character. The other letters were much the same, and the interest which they naturally excited was increased by the accounts which the missionaries gave of the greatness and renown of this more than royal convert and of the progress which Christianity had made and was still making in his dominions through their instrumentality. It is supposed in modern times that these stories were pretty much all inventions on the part of the missionaries, or, at least, that the accounts which they sent were greatly exaggerated and embellished, and there is but little doubt that they had much more to do with the authorship of the letters than any con. Still, however, it is supposed that there was a great prince who at least encouraged the missionaries in their work, and allowed them to preach Christianity in his dominions, and if so, there is little doubt that Vang Khan was the man. At all events, he was a very great and powerful prince, and he reigned over a wide extent of country. The name of his capital was Karakoram. The distance which Temujin had to travel to reach this city was about ten days' journey. He was received by Vang Khan with great marks of kindness and consideration. Vang Khan promised to protect him, and in due time, to assist him in recovering his kingdom. In the meanwhile, Temujin promised to enter at once into Vang Khan's service, and to devote himself faithfully to promoting the interests of his kind protector by every means in his power. 
End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 Temujin in Exile 1182 Vang Khan gave Temujin a very honorable position in his court. It was natural that he should do so, for Temujin was a prince in the prime of his youth, and of very attractive person and manners. And, though he was for the present an exile, as it were from his native land, he was not by any means in a destitute or hopeless condition. His family and friends were still in the ascendancy at home, and he himself, in coming to the kingdom of Vang Khan, had brought with him quite an important body of troops. Being, at the same time, personally possessed of great courage and of much military skill, he was prepared to render his protector good service in return for his protection. In a word, the arrival of Temujin at the court of Vang Khan was an event calculated to make quite a sensation. At first, everybody was very much pleased with him, and he was very popular, but before long the other young princes of the court, and the chieftains of the neighboring tribes, began to be jealous of him. Vang Khan gave him precedence over them all, partly on account of his personal attachment to him, and partly on account of the rank which he held in his own country, which, being that of a sovereign prince, naturally entitled him to the very highest position among the subordinate chieftains in the retinue of Vang Khan. But these subordinate chieftains were not satisfied. They murmured, at first secretly, and afterward more openly, and soon began to form combinations and plots against the new favorite, as they called him. An incident soon occurred which greatly increased this animosity, and gave to Temujin's enemies, all at once, a very powerful leader and head. This leader was a very influential chieftain named Yamuka. This Yamuka, it seems, was in love with the daughter of Vang Khan, the princess Wisulijin. He asked her in marriage of her father. To precisely what state of forwardness the negotiations had advanced does not appear, but, at any rate, when Temujin arrived, Wisulujin soon began to turn her thoughts toward him. He was undoubtedly younger, handsomer, and more accomplished than her old lover, and before long she gave her father to understand that she would much rather have him for her husband than Yamuka. It is true, Temujin had one or two wives already, but this made no difference, for it was the custom then, as indeed it is still, for the Asiatic princes and chieftains to take as many wives as their wealth and position would enable them to maintain. Yamuka was accordingly refused, and Wasulujin was given in marriage to Temujin. Yamuka was, of course, dreadfully enraged. He vowed that he would be revenged. He immediately began to intrigue with all the discontented persons and parties in the kingdom, not only with those who were envious and jealous of Temujin, but also with those who, for any reason, were disposed to put themselves in opposition to Vang Khan's government. Thus a formidable conspiracy was formed for the purpose of compassing Temujin's ruin. The conspirators first tried the effect of private remonstrances with Vang Khan, in which they made all sorts of evil representations against Temujin, but to no effect. Temujin rallied about him so many old friends, and made so many new friends by his courage and energy, that his party at court proved stronger than that of his enemies, and for a time they seemed likely to fail entirely of their design. At length the conspirators opened communication with the foreign enemies of Vang Khan, and formed a league with them to make war against and destroy both Vang Khan and Temujin together. The accounts of the process of this league, and of the different nations and tribes which took part in it, is imperfect and confused. But at length, after various preliminary contests and maneuvers, arrangements were made for assembling a large army with a view of invading Vang Khan's dominions and deciding the question by a battle. The different chieftains and khans whose troops were united to form this army bound themselves together by a solemn oath, according to the customs of those times, not to rest until both Vang Khan and Temujin should be destroyed. The manner in which they took the oath was this. They brought out into an open space on the plain where they had assembled to take the oath, a horse, a wild ox, and a dog. At a given signal they fell upon these animals with their swords, and cut them all to pieces in the most furious manner. 
When they had finished, they stood together and called out aloud in the following words. Hear, O God, O heaven, O earth, the oath that we swear against Van Khan and Temujin. If any one of us spares them when we have them in our power, or if we fail to keep the promise that we have made to destroy them, may we meet with the same fate that has befallen these beasts that we have now cut to pieces. They uttered this imprecation in a very solemn manner, standing among the mangled and bloody remains of the beasts which lay strewed all about the ground. These preparations had been made thus far very secretly, but tidings of what was going on came, before a great while, to Karakorum, Van Khan's capital. Temujin was greatly excited when he heard the news. He immediately proposed that he should take his own troops and join with them as many of Van Khan's soldiers as could be conveniently spared, and go forth to meet the enemy. To this Van Khan consented. Temujin took one half of Van Khan's troops to join his own, leaving the other half to protect the capital, and so set forth on his expedition. He went off in the direction toward the frontier where he had understood the principal part of the hostile forces were assembling. After a long march, probably one of many days, he arrived there before the enemy was quite prepared for him. Then followed a series of maneuvers and counter-maneuvers, in which Temujin was all the time endeavoring to bring the rebels to battle, while they were doing all in their power to avoid it. Their object in this delay was to gain time for reinforcements to come in, consisting of bodies of troops belonging to certain members of the League who had not yet arrived. At length, when these maneuvers were brought to an end, and the battle was about to be fought, Temujin and his whole army were one day greatly surprised to see his father-in-law, Van Khan himself, coming into the camp at the head of a small and forlorn-looking band of followers, who had all the appearance of fugitives escaped from a battle. They looked anxious, wayworn, and exhausted, and the horses that they rode seemed wholly spent with fatigue and privation. On explanation, Temujin learned that, as soon as it was known that he had left the capital, and taken with him a large part of the army, a certain tribe of Van Khan's enemies, living in another direction, had determined to seize the opportunity to invade his dominions, and had accordingly come suddenly in, with an immense horde, to attack the capital. Van Khan had done all that he could to defend the city, but he had been overpowered. The greater part of his soldiers had been killed or wounded. The city had been taken and pillaged. His son, with those of the troops that had been able to save themselves, had escaped to the mountains. As to Van Khan himself, he had thought it best to make his way as soon as possible to the camp of Temujin, where he had now arrived, after enduring great hardships and sufferings on the way. Temujin was at first much amazed at hearing this story. He, however, bade his father-in-law not to be cast down or discouraged, and promised him full revenge and a complete triumph over all his enemies at the coming battle. So he proceeded at once to complete his arrangements for the coming fight. He resigned to Van Khan the command of the main body of the army, while he placed himself at the head of one of the wings, assigning the other to the chieftain next in rank in his army. In this order he went to battle. The battle was a very obstinate and bloody one, but in the end, Temujin's party was victorious. The troops opposed to him were defeated and driven off the field. The victory appeared to be due altogether to Temujin himself, for, after the struggle had continued a long time, and the result still appeared doubtful, the troops of Temujin's wing finally made a desperate charge and forced their way with such fury into the midst of the forces of the enemy that nothing could withstand them. This encouraged and animated the other troops to such a degree that very soon the enemy were entirely routed and driven from off the field. The effect of this victory was to raise the reputation of Temujin as a military commander higher than ever, and greatly to increase the confidence which Van Khan was inclined to repose in him. The victory, too, seemed at first to have well-nigh broken up the party of the rebels. Still, the way was not yet open for Van Khan to return and take possession of his throne and of his capital, for he learned that one of his brothers had assumed the government and was reigning in Karakorum in his place. It would seem that this brother, whose name was Erkakara, had been one of the leaders of the party opposed to Temujin. It was natural that he should be so, for, being the brother of the king, 
he would, of course, occupy a very high position in the court, and would be one of the first to experience the ill effects produced by the coming in of any new favorite. He had accordingly joined in the plots that were formed against Temujin and Van Khan. Indeed, he was considered, in some respects, as the head of their party, and when Van Khan was driven away from his capital, this brother assumed the throne in his stead. The question was, how could he now be dispossessed and Van Khan restored? Temujin began immediately to form his plans for the accomplishment of this purpose. He concentrated his forces after the battle, and soon afterward opened negotiations with other tribes, who had before been uncertain which side to espouse, but were now assisted a great deal in coming to a decision by the victory which Temujin had obtained. In the meantime the rebels were not idle. They banded themselves together anew, and made great exertions to procure reinforcements. Erkakara fortified himself as strongly as possible in Karakoram, and collected ample supplies of ammunition and military stores. It was not until the following year that the parties had completed their preparations and were prepared for the final struggle. Then, however, another great battle was fought, and again Temujin was victorious. Erkakara was killed or driven away in his turn. Karakoram was retaken and Van Khan entered it in triumph at the head of his troops, and was once more established on his throne. Of course, the rank and influence of Temujin at his court was now higher than ever before. He was now about twenty-two or twenty-three years of age. He had already three wives, though it is not certain that all of them were with him at Van Khan's court. He was extremely popular in the army, as young commanders of great courage and spirit almost always are. Van Khan placed great reliance upon him, and lavished upon him all possible honors. He does not seem, however, yet to have begun to form any plans for returning to his native land. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 Rupture with Van Khan 1182-1202 to 1202. Temujin remained at the court or in the dominions of Van Khan, for a great many years. During the greater portion of this time, he continued in the service of Van Khan, and on good terms with him, though in the end, as we shall presently see, their friendship was turned into a bitter enmity. Erkakara, Van Khan's brother, who had usurped his throne during the rebellion, was killed, it was said, at the time when Van Khan recovered his throne. Several of the other rebel chieftains were also killed, but some of them succeeded in saving themselves from utter ruin, and in gradually recovering their former power over the hordes which they respectively commanded. It must be remembered that the country was not divided at this time into regular territorial states and kingdoms, but was rather one vast undivided region, occupied by immense hordes, each of which was more or less stationary, it is true, in its own district or range but was nevertheless without any permanent settlement. The various clans drifted slowly this way and that among the plains and mountains, as the prospects of pasturage, the fortune of war, or the pressure of conterminous hordes might incline them. In cases, too, where a number of hordes were united under one general chieftain, as was the case with those over whom Van Khan claimed to have sway, the tie by which they were bound together was very feeble and the distinction between a state of submission and of rebellion, except in case of actual war, was very slightly defined. Yamuka, the chieftain who had been so exasperated against Temujin on account of his being supplanted by him in the affections of the young princess, Van Khan's daughter, whom Temujin had married for his third wife, succeeded in making his escape at the time when Van Khan conquered his enemies and recovered his throne. For a time he concealed himself, or at least kept out of Van Khan's reach, by dwelling with hordes whose range was at some distance from Karakoram. He soon, however, contrived to open secret negotiations with one of Van Khan's sons, whose name was something that sounded like Sankum. Some authors, in attempting to represent his name in our letters, spelled it Sungim. Yamuka easily persuaded this young Sankum to take sides with him in the quarrel. It was natural that he should do so, for, being the son of Van Khan, 
he was in some measure displaced from his own legitimate and proper position at his father's court by the great and constantly increasing influence which Temujin exercised. And besides, said Yamuka, in the secret representations which he made to Sankum, this newcomer is not only interfering with and curtailing your proper influence and consideration now, but his design is by and by to circumvent and supplant you altogether. He is forming plans for making himself your father's heir, and so robbing you of your rightful inheritance. Sankum listened very eagerly to these suggestions, and finally it was agreed between him and Yamuka that Sankum should exert his influence with his father to obtain permission for Yamuka to come back to court and to be received again into his father's service, under pretense of having repented of his rebellion, and of being now disposed to return to his allegiance. Sankum did this, and after a time, Vang Khan was persuaded to allow Yamuka to return. Thus a sort of outward peace was made, but it was no real peace. Yamuka was as envious and jealous of Temujin as ever, and now, moreover, in addition to this envy and jealousy, he felt the stimulus of revenge. Things, however, seemed to have gone on very quietly for a time, or at least without any open outbreak in the court. During this time, Vang Khan was, as usual with such princes, frequently engaged in wars with the neighboring hordes. In these wars he relied a great deal on Temujin. Temujin was in command of a large body of troops, which consisted in part of his own guard, the troops that had come with him from his own country and in part of other bands of men whom Vang Khan had placed under his orders, or who had joined him of their own accord. He was assisted in the command of this body by four subordinate generals, or Khans, whom he called his four intrepids. They were all very brave and skillful commanders. At the head of this troop, Temujin was accustomed to scour the country, hunting out Vang Khan's enemies, or making long expeditions over distant plains or among the mountains, in the prosecution of Vang Khan's warlike projects, whether those of invasion and plunder, or of retaliation and vengeance. Temujin was extremely popular with the soldiers who served under him. Soldiers always love a dashing, fearless, and energetic leader, who has the genius to devise brilliant schemes, and the spirit to execute them in a brilliant manner. They care very little how dangerous the situations are into which he may lead them, those that get killed in performing the exploits which he undertakes cannot speak to complain, and those who survive are only so much the better pleased that the dangers that they have been brought safely through were so desperate, and that the harvest of glory which they have thereby acquired is so great. Temujin, though a great favorite with his own men, was, like almost all half-savage warriors of his class, utterly merciless when he was angry in his treatment of his enemies. It is said that, after one of his battles, in which he had gained a complete victory over an immense horde of rebels and other foes, and had taken great numbers of them prisoners, he ordered fires to be built, and seventy large cauldrons of water to be put over them. And then, when the water was boiling hot, he caused the principal leaders of the vanquished army to be thrown in headlong and thus scalded to death. Then he marched at once into the country of the enemy and there took all the women and children, and sent them off to be sold as slaves, and seized the cattle and other property which he found, and carried it off as plunder. In thus taking possession of the enemy's property and making it his own, and selling the poor captives into slavery, there was nothing remarkable. Such was the custom of the times. But the act of scalding his prisoners to death seems to denote or reveal in his character a vein of peculiar and atrocious cruelty. It is possible, however, that the story may not be true. It may have been invented by Yamuka and Sankum, or by some of his other enemies. For Yamuka and Sankum, and others who were combined with them, were continually endeavoring to undermine Temujin's influence with Vang Khan, and thus deprive him of his power. But he was too strong for them. His great success in all his military undertakings kept him up in spite of all that his rivals could do to pull him down. As for Vang Khan himself, he was in part pleased with him and proud of him, and in part he feared him. He was very unwilling to be so dependent upon a subordinate chieftain, and yet he could not do without him. 
a king never desires that any one of his subjects should become too conspicuous or too great, and Van Khan would have been very glad to have diminished in some way the power and prestige which Temujin had acquired, and which seemed to be increasing every day. He, however, found no means of effecting this in any quiet and peaceful manner. Temujin was at the head of his troops, generally away from Karakorum, where Van Khan resided, and he was, in a great measure, independent. He raised his own recruits to keep the numbers of his army good, and it was always easy to subsist if there chanced to be any failure in the ordinary and regular supplies. Besides, occasions were continually occurring in which Van Khan wished for Temujin's aid, and could not dispense with it. At one time, while engaged in some important campaigns, far away among the mountains, Yamuka contrived to awaken so much distress of Temujin in Van Kong's mind that Van Khan secretly decamped in the night and marched away to a distant place to save himself from a plot which Yamuka had told him that Temujin was contriving. Here, however, he was attacked by a large body of his enemies and was reduced to such straits that he was obliged to send couriers off at once to Temujin to come with his intrepids and save him. Temujin came. He rescued Van Khan from his danger, and drove his enemies away. Van Khan was very grateful for this service, so that the two friends became entirely reconciled to each other, and were united more closely than ever, greatly to Yamuka's disappointment and chagrin. They made a new league of amity, and to seal and confirm it, they agreed upon a double marriage between their two families. A son of Temujin was to be married to a daughter of Van Khan, and a son of Van Khan to a daughter of Temujin. This new compact did not, however, last long. As soon as Van Khan found that the danger from which Temujin had rescued him was past, he began again to listen to the representations of Yamuka and Sankum, who still insisted that Temujin was a very dangerous man and was by no means to be trusted. They said that he was ambitious and unprincipled, and that he was only waiting for a favorable opportunity to rebel himself against Van Khan and depose him from his throne. They made a great many statements to the Khan in confirmation of their opinion, some of which were true, doubtless, but many were exaggerated, and others probably false. They, however, succeeded at last in making such an impression upon the Khan's mind that he finally determined to take measures for putting Temujin out of the way. Accordingly, on some pretext or other, he contrived to send Temujin away from Karakorum, his capital, for Temujin was so great a favorite with the royal guards and with all the garrison of the town, that he did not dare to undertake anything openly against him there. Van Khan also sent a messenger to Temujin's own country to persuade the chief persons there to join him in his plot. It will be recollected that, at the time when Temujin left his own country, when he was about fourteen years old, his mother had married a great chieftain there, named Menglik, and that this Menglik, in conjunction doubtless with Temujin's mother, had been made regent during his absence. Van Khan now sent to Menglik to propose that he should unite with him to destroy Temujin. You have no interest, said Van Khan in the message that he sent to Menglik, in taking his part. It is true that you have married his mother, but personally he is nothing to you, and if he is once out of the way, you will be acknowledged as the Grand Khan of the Mongols in your own right, whereas you now hold your place in subordination to him, and he may at any time return and set you aside altogether. Van Khan hoped by these arguments to induce Menglik to come and assist him in his plan of putting Temujin to death, or, at least, if Menglik would not assist him in perpetrating the deed, he thought that, by these arguments, he should induce him to be willing that it should be committed so that he should himself have nothing to fear afterward from his resentment. But Menglik received the proposal in a very different way from what Van Khan had expected. He said nothing, but he determined immediately to let Temujin know of the danger that he was in. He accordingly at once set to go out to Temujin's camp to inform him of Van Khan's designs. In the meantime, Van Khan, having matured his plans, made an appointment for Temujin to meet him at a certain place designated for the purpose of consummating the double marriage between their children, which had been before agreed upon. Temujin, not suspecting any treachery, received and entertained the messenger in a very honorable manner, and said that he would come. 
After making the necessary preparations, he set out, in company with the messenger, and with a grand retinue of his own attendants, to go to the place appointed. On his way, he was met or overtaken by Menglik, who had come to warn him of his danger. As soon as Temujin had heard what his stepfather had to say, he made some excuse for postponing the journey, and, sending a civil answer to Van Khan by the ambassador, he ordered him to go forward, and went back himself to his own camp. This camp was at some distance from Karakorum. Van Khan, as has already been stated, had sent Temujin away from the capital on account of his being so great a favorite that he was afraid of some tumult if he were to attempt anything against him there. Temujin was, however, pretty strong in his camp. The troops that usually attended him there, with four intrepids as commanders of the four principal divisions of them. His old instructor and guardian, Karashur, was with him too. Karashur, it seems, had continued in Temujin's service up to this time, and was accustomed to accompany him in all his expeditions as his counselor and friend. When Van Kong learned, by the return of his messenger, that Temujin declined to come to the place of rendezvous which he had appointed, he concluded at once that he suspected treachery, and he immediately decided that he must now strike a decisive blow without any delay, otherwise Temujin would put himself more and more on his guard. He was not mistaken, it seems, however, in thinking how great a favorite Temujin was at Karakorum, for his secret design was betrayed to Temujin by two of his servants, who overheard him speak of it to one of his wives. Van Khan's plan was to go out secretly to Temujin's camp at the head of an armed force superior to his, and there come upon him and his whole troop suddenly, by surprise, in the night, by which means, he thought, he should easily overpower the whole encampment and either kill Temujin and his generals, or else make them prisoners. The two men who betrayed this plan were slaves, who were employed to take care of the horses of some person connected with Van Khan's household, and to render various other services. Their names were Badu and Kishlik. It seems that these men were one day carrying some milk to Van Khan's house or tent, and there they overheard a conversation between Van Khan and his wife, by which they learned the particulars of the plan formed for Temujin's destruction. The expedition was to set out, they heard, on the following morning. It is not at all surprising that they overheard this conversation. For not only the tents, but even the houses used by these Asiatic nations were built of very frail and thin materials, and the partitions were often made of canvas and felt, and other such substances as could have very little power to intercept sound. The two slaves determined to proceed at once to Temujin's camp, and warn him of his danger. So they stole away from their quarters at nightfall, and, after traveling diligently all night, in the morning they reached the camp and told Temujin what they had learned. Temujin was surprised, but he had been, in some measure, prepared for such intelligence by the communication which his stepfather had made him in respect to Van Khan's treacherous designs a few days before. He immediately summoned Karasher and some of his other friends, in order to consult in respect to what it was best to do. It was resolved to elude Van Khan's design by means of a stratagem. He was to come upon them, according to the account of the slaves, that night. The preparations for receiving him were consequently to be made at once. The plan was for Temujin and all his troops to withdraw from the camp and conceal themselves in a place of ambuscade nearby. They were to leave a number of men behind, who, when night came on, were to set the lights and replenish the fires, and put everything in such condition as to make it appear that the troops were all there. Their expectation was that, when Van Khan should arrive, he would make his assault according to his original design, and then, while his forces were in the midst of the confusion incident to such an onset, Temujin was to come forth from his ambuscade and fall upon them. In this way he hoped to conquer them and put them to flight, although he had every reason to suppose that the force which Van Khan would bring out against him would be considerably stronger in numbers than his own. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight: Progress of the Quarrel, 1202. Temujin's stratagem succeeded admirably. As soon as he had decided upon it, he began to put it into execution. He caused everything of value 
to be taken out of his tent and carried away to a place of safety. He sent away the women and children, too, to the same place. He then marshaled all his men, excepting the small guard that he was going to leave behind until evening, and led them off to the ambuscade which he had chosen for them. The place was about two leagues distant from his camp. Temujin concealed himself here in a narrow dell among the mountains, not far from the road where Vang Khan would have to pass along. The dell was narrow and was protected by precipitous rocks on each side. There was a wood at the entrance to it also, which concealed those that were hidden in it from view, and a brook which flowed by near the entrance, so that, in going in or coming out, it was necessary to ford the brook. Temujin, on arriving at the spot, went with all his troops into the dell and concealed himself there. In the meantime, the guard that had been left behind in the camp had been instructed to kindle up the campfires as soon as the evening came on, according to the usual custom, and to set lights in the tents so as to give the camp the appearance, when seen from a little distance in the night, of being occupied as usual by the army. They were to wait and watch the fires and lights until they perceived signs of the approach of the enemy to attack the camp, when they were secretly to retire on the farther side and so make their escape. These preparations and the march of Temujin's troops to the place of ambuscade occupied almost the whole of the day, and it was near evening before the last of the troops had entered the dell. They had scarce accomplished this maneuver before Vang Khan's army arrived. Vang Khan himself was not with them. He had entrusted the expedition to the command of Sankam and Yamuka. Indeed, it is probable that they were the real originators and contrivers of it, and that Vang Khan had only been induced to give his consent to it, and that perhaps reluctantly, by their persuasions. Sankam and Yamuka advanced cautiously at the head of their columns, and when they saw the illumination of the camp produced by the lights and the campfires, they thought at once that all was right, and that their old enemy and rival was now, at last, within their reach and at their mercy. They brought up the men as near to the camp as they could come without being observed, and then, drawing their bows and making their arrows ready, they advanced furiously to the onset and discharged an immense shower of arrows in among the tents. They expected to see thousands of men come rushing out from the tents or starting up from the ground at this sudden assault, but to their utter astonishment all was silent and motionless after the falling of the arrows as before. They then discharged more arrows, and finding that they could not awaken any signs of life, they began to advance cautiously and enter the camp. They found, of course, that it had been entirely evacuated. They then rode round and round the enclosure, examining the ground with flambeaux and torches to find the tracks which Temujin's army had made in going away. The tracks were soon discovered. Those who first saw them immediately set off in pursuit of the fugitives, as they supposed them, shouting at the same time for the rest to follow. Some did follow immediately. Others, who had strayed away to greater or less distances on either side of the camp in search of the tracks, fell in by degrees as they received the order, while others still remained among the tents, where they were to be seen riding to and fro, endeavoring to make discoveries, or gathering together in groups to express to one another their astonishment or to inquire what was next to be done. They, however, all gradually fell into the ranks of those who were following the track which had been found, and the whole body went on as fast as they could go, and in great confusion. They all supposed that Temujin and his troops were making a precipitate retreat, 
and were expecting every moment to come up to him in his rear, in which case he would be taken at great disadvantage, and would be easily overwhelmed. Instead of this, Temujin was just coming forward from his hiding place, with his squadrons all in perfect order, and advancing in a firm, steady, and compact column, all being ready at the word of command to charge in good order, but with terrible impetuosity upon the advancing enemy. In this way the two armies came together. The shock of the encounter was terrific. Temujin, as might have been expected, was completely victorious. The confused masses of Vang Khan's army were overborne, thrown into dreadful confusion, and trampled underfoot. Great numbers were killed. Those that escaped, being killed at once, turned and fled. Sankum was wounded in the face by an arrow, but he still was able to keep his seat upon his horse, and so galloped away. Those that succeeded in saving themselves got back as soon as they could into the road by which they came, and so made their way in detached and open parties home to Karakoram. Of course, after this, Vang Khan could no longer dissimulate his hostility to Temujin, and both parties prepared for open war. The different historians through whom we derive our information in respect to the life and adventures of Genghis Khan have related the transactions which occurred after this open outbreak between Temujin and Vang Khan somewhat differently. Combining their accounts, we learn that both parties, after the battle, opened negotiations with such neighboring tribes as they supposed likely to take sides in the conflict, each endeavoring to gain as many adherents as possible to his own cause. Temujin obtained the alliance and cooperation of a great number of Tartar princes who ruled over hordes that dwelt in that part of the country, or among the mountains around. Some of these chieftains were his relatives. Others were induced to join him by being convinced that he would, in the end, prove to be stronger than Vang Khan, and being in some sense politicians as well as warriors, they wished to be sure of coming out at the close of the contest on the victorious side. There was a certain Khan named Turkili, who was a relative of Temujin, and who commanded a very powerful tribe. On approaching the confines of his territory, Temujin, not being certain of Turkili's disposition toward him, sent forward an ambassador to announce his approach, and to ask if Turkili still retained the friendship which had long subsisted between them. Turkili might, perhaps, have hesitated which side to join, but the presence of Temujin with his whole troop upon his frontier seems to have determined him, so he sent a favorable answer, and at once espoused Temujin's cause. Many other chieftains joined Temujin in much the same way, and thus the forces under his command were constantly increased. At length, in his progress across the country, he came with his troop of followers to a place where there was a stream of salt or bitter water which was unfit to drink. Temujin encamped on the shores of this stream and performed a grand ceremony in which he himself and his allies banded themselves together in the most solemn manner. In the course of the ceremony, a horse was sacrificed on the shores of the stream. Temujin also took up some of the water from the brook and drank it, invoking heaven at the same time to witness a solemn vow which he made that as long as he lived he would share with his officers and soldiers the bitter as well as the sweet and imprecating curses upon himself if he should ever violate his oath. All his allies and officers did the same after him. This ceremony was long remembered in the army. All those who had been present and had taken part in it, cherishing the recollection of it with pride and pleasure. And long afterward, when Temujin had attained to the height of his power and glory, his generals considered their having been present at this first 
solemn league and covenant as conferring upon them a sort of title of nobility by which they and their descendants were to be distinguished forever above all those whose adhesion to the cause of the conqueror dated from a later time by this time temujin began to feel quite strong he moved on with his army till he came to the borders of a lake which was not a great way from vang khan's dominions here he encamped and before proceeding any farther he determined to try the effect upon the mind of vang khan of a letter of expostulation and remonstrance so he wrote to him substantially as follows a great many years ago in the time of my father when you were driven from your throne by your enemies my father came to your aid defeated your enemies and restored you at a later time after i had come into your dominions your brother conspired against you with the marcats and the naamans i defeated them and helped you to recover your power when you were reduced to great distress i shared with you my flocks and everything that i had at another time when you were in circumstances of great danger and distress you sent to me to ask that my four intrepids might go and rescue you i sent them according to your request and they delivered you from a most imminent danger they helped you to conquer your enemies and to recover an immense booty from them in many other instances when the khans have combined against you i have given you most effectual aid in subduing them how is it then after receiving all these benefits from me for a period of so many years that you form plans to destroy me in so base and treacherous a manner this letter seems to have produced some impression upon vang khan's mind but he was now it seems so much under the influence of sankum and yemuka that he could decide nothing for himself he sent the letter to sankum to ask him what answer should be returned but sankum in addition to his former feelings of envy and jealousy against temujin was now irritated and angry in consequence of the wound that he had received and determined to have his revenge he would not hear of any accommodation in the meantime the khans of all the tartar and mongol tribes that lived in the countries bordering on vang khan's dominions hearing of the rupture between vang khan and temujin and aware of the great struggle for the mastery between those two potentates that was about to take place became more and more interested in the quarrel temujin was very active in opening negotiations with them and in endeavoring to induce them to take his side he was a comparatively young and rising man while vang khan was becoming advanced in years and was now almost wholly under the influence of sankum and yamuka temujin moreover had already acquired great fame and great popularity as a commander and his reputation was increasing every day while vang khan's glory was evidently on the wan a great number of the khans were of course predisposed to take temujin's side others he compelled to join him by force and others he persuaded by promising to release them from the exactions and the tyranny which vang khan had exercised over them and declaring that he was a messenger especially sent from heaven to accomplish their deliverance those asiatic tribes were always ready to believe in military messengers sent from heaven to make conquests for their benefit among other nations who joined temujin at this time were the people of his own country of mongolistan proper he was received very joyfully by his stepfather who was in command there and by all his former subjects and they all promised to sustain him in the coming war after a time when temujin had by these and similar means greatly increased the number of his adherents and proportionately strengthened his position he sent an ambassador again to vang khan to propose some accommodation vang khan called a council to consider the proposal but sankum and yamuka 
persisted in refusing to allow any accommodation to be made. They declared that they would not listen to proposals of peace on any other condition than that of the absolute surrender of Temujin, and of all who were confederate with him, to Vang Khan as their lawful sovereign. Sankum himself delivered the message to the ambassador. Tell the rebel Mongols, he said, that they are to expect no peace, but by submitting absolutely to the Khan's will. And as for Temujin, I will never see him again till I come to him sword in hand to kill him. Immediately after this, Sankum and Yamaka sent off some small plundering expeditions into the Mongol country, but they were driven back by Temujin's troops without effecting their purpose. The result of these skirmishes was, however, greatly to exasperate both parties and to lead them to prepare in earnest for open war. End of chapter 8 The Death of Vang Khan, 1202 The Grand Council was now called of all the Confederates who were leagued with Temujin at a place called Mankarul to make arrangements for a vigorous prosecution of the war. At this council were convened all the chieftains and khans that had been induced to declare against Vang Khan. Each one came attended by a considerable body of troops as his escort, and a grand deliberation was held. Some were in favor of trying once more to come to some terms of accommodation with Vang Khan, but Temujin convinced them that there was nothing to be hoped for except on condition of absolute submission, and that, in that case, Vang Khan would never be content until he had effected the utter ruin of everyone who had been engaged in the rebellion. So it was, at last, decided that every man should return to his own tribe and there raise as large a force as he could, with a view to carrying on the war with the utmost vigor. Temujin was formally appointed general-in-chief of the army to be raised. There was a sort of truncheon, or ornamented club, called the topaz, which it was customary on such occasions to bestow with great solemnity on the general thus chosen as his badge of command. The topaz was, in this instance, conferred upon Temujin with all the usual ceremonies. He accepted it on the express condition that every man would punctually and implicitly obey all his orders, and that he should have absolute power to punish anyone who should disobey him in the way that he judged best, and that they should submit without question to all his decisions. To these conditions they all solemnly agreed. Being thus regularly placed in command, Temujin began by giving places of honor and authority to those who left Vang Khan's service to follow him. He took this occasion to remember and reward the two slaves who had come to him in the night at his camp some time before to give him warning of the design of Sankum and Yamaka to come and surprise him there. He gave the slaves their freedom and made provision for their maintenance as long as they should live. He also put them on the list of exempts. The exempts were a class of persons upon whom, as a reward for great public services, were conferred certain exclusive rights and privileges. They had no taxes to pay. In case of plunder taken from the enemy, they received their full share without any deduction while all the others were obliged to contribute a portion of their shares for the Khan. The exempts, too, were allowed various other privileges. They had the right to go into the presence of the Khan at any time without waiting, as others were obliged to do, till they obtained permission. And what was more singular still, they were entitled to nine pardons for any offenses that they might commit so that it was only when they had committed ten misdemeanors or crimes that they were in danger of punishment. The privileges which Temujin thus bestowed upon the slaves were to be continued to their descendants 
to the seventh generation. Temujin rewarded the slaves in this bountiful manner, partly, no doubt, out of sincere gratitude to them for having been the means, probably, of saving him and his army from destruction, and partly for effect, in order to impress upon his followers a strong conviction that any great services rendered to him or to his cause were certain to be well rewarded. Temujin now found himself at the head of a very large body of men, and his first care was to establish a settled system of discipline among them, so that they could act with regularity and order when coming into battle. He divided his army into three separate bodies. The center was composed of his own guards and was commanded by himself. The wings were formed of the squadrons of his confederates and allies. His plan in coming into battle was to send forward the two wings, retaining the center as a reserve, and hold them prepared to rush in with irresistible power whenever the time should arrive at which their coming would produce the greatest effect. When everything was thus arranged, Temujin set his army in motion and began to advance toward the country of Vang Khan. The squadrons which composed his immense horde were so numerous that they covered all the plain. In the meantime, Vang Khan had not been idle. He, or rather Sankum and Yamuka, acting in his name, had assembled a great army, and he had set out on his march from Karakoram to meet his enemy. His forces, however, though more numerous, were by no means so well disciplined and arranged as those of Temujin. They were greatly encumbered, too, with baggage, the army being followed in its march by endless trains of wagons, conveying provisions, arms, and military stores of all kinds. Its progress was, therefore, necessarily slow, for the troops of horsemen were obliged to regulate their speed by the movement of the wagons, which, on account of the heavy burdens that they contained and the want of finished roads, was necessarily slow. The two armies met upon a plain between two rivers, and a most desperate and bloody battle ensued. Karasher, Temujin's former tutor, led one of the divisions of Temujin's army, and was opposed by Yamuka, who headed the wing of Vang Khan's army, which confronted his division. The other wings attacked each other, too, in the most furious manner, and for three hours it was doubtful which party would be successful. At length, Temujin, who had all this time remained in the background with his reserve, saw that the favorable moment had arrived for him to intervene, and he gave the order for his guards to charge, which they did with such impetuosity as to carry all before them. One after another of Vang Khan's squadrons was overpowered, thrown into confusion, and driven from the field. It was not long before Vang Khan saw that all was lost. He gave up the contest and fled. A small troop of horsemen, consisting of his immediate attendants and guards, went with him. At first the fugitives took the road toward Karakoram. They were, however, so hotly pursued that they were obliged to turn off in another direction, and finally Vang Khan resolved to fly from his own country altogether and appeal for protection to a certain chieftain named Tayyan Khan, who ruled over a great horde called the Naimans, one of the most powerful tribes in the country of Karakate. This Tayyan was the father of Temujin's first wife, the young princess to whom he was married during the lifetime of his father, when he was only about fourteen years old. It was thought strange that Vang Khan should thus seek refuge among the Naimans, for he had not, for some time past, been on friendly terms either with Tayyan, the Khan, or with the tribe. There were, in particular, a considerable number of the subordinate chieftains who cherished a deep-seated resentment against him for injuries which he had inflicted upon them and upon their country in former wars. But all these Tartar tribes entertained very high ideas 
of the obligations of hospitality, and Vang Khan thought that when the Naimans saw him coming among them, a fugitive and in distress, they would lay aside their animosity and give him a kind reception. Indeed, Tai Yen himself, on whom, as the head of the tribe, the chief discredit would attach of any evil befalling a visitor and a guest who had come in his distress to seek hospitality, was inclined at first to receive his enemy kindly and to offer him a refuge. He debated the matter with the other chieftains after Vang Khan had entered his dominions and was approaching his camp. But they were extremely unwilling that any mercy should be shown to their fallen enemy. They represented to Taiyan how great an enemy he had always been to them. They exaggerated the injuries which he had done them, and represented them in their worst light. They said, moreover, that by harboring Vang Khan, they should only involve themselves in a war with Temujin, who would undoubtedly follow his enemy into their country and would greatly resent any attempt on their part to protect him. These considerations had great effect on the mind of Taiyin, but still he could not bring himself to give his formal consent to any act of hostility against Vang Khan. So the other chieftains held a council among themselves to consider what they should do. They resolved to take upon themselves the responsibility of slaying Vang Khan. We cannot induce Taiyin openly to authorize it, they said, but he secretly desires it, and he will be glad when it is done. Taiyin knew very well what course things were taking, though he pretended not to know, and so allowed the other chiefs to go on in their own way. They accordingly fitted out a troop, and two of the chieftains, the two who felt the most bitter and determined hatred against Vang Khan, placing themselves at the head of it, set off to intercept him. He had lingered on the way, it seems, after entering the Naaman territory, in order to learn, before he advanced too far, what reception he was likely to meet with. The troop of Naamans came suddenly upon him in his encampment, slew all his attendants, and seizing Vang Khan, they cut off his head. They left the body where it lay, and carried off the head to show it to Taiyin. Taiyin was secretly pleased, and he could not quite conceal the gratification which the death of his old enemy afforded him. He even addressed the head in words of scorn and spite, which revealed the exultation that he felt at the downfall of his rival. Then, however, checking himself, he blamed the chieftains for killing him. Considering his venerable age, said he, and his past greatness and renown as a prince and commander, you would have done much better to have acted as his guards than as his executioners. Taiyin ordered the head to be treated with the utmost respect. After properly preparing it, by some process of drying and preserving, he caused it to be enclosed in a case of silver and set in a place of honor. While the preparations for this sort of entombment were making, the head was an object of a very solemn and mysterious interest for all the horde. They said that the tongue thrust itself several times out of the mouth, and the soothsayers, who watched the changes with great attention, drew from them important presages in respect to the coming events of the war. These presages were strongly in favor of the increasing prosperity and power of Temujin. Sankum, the son of Vang Khan, was killed in the battle, but Yamuka escaped. End of chapter 9